Hello there. I am Scorched Scales, and over the last week, I have been reading The Poison Jungle, which is also the halfway mark for Arc 3, since Arc 3 has six books, and I think half of six might be free. And I'm pretty sure that this very book is the fan favorite of Arc 3. But to see what I think about it, we'll have to go to the tier list. So, as for the Poison Jungle, right now, I would personally rank it around here. Yeah. I'm dead. So yes, to clarify, I did like this book, as you can tell. <laughs> But I didn't like it as much as the Hive Queen. Now here, it mainly comes down to personal preference. As if... Everything wasn't already a personal preference. But I personally... Preferred Cricket's story. I personally preferred her point of view. I still liked Sundu's. I just personally preferred Cricket's. But the odd thing is... I do have a lot of positive things to say about this book, but thinking about it, I have a handful of small negative things. So like, I don't really know why I didn't rank it higher, because for me, the Hive Queen had a big flaw at the end of it that I personally had gripes with, but the Poison Jungle doesn't have a issue as big as that. But yet, I've ranked it lower than the Hive Queen. So who knows, this might be a decision that I reverse in the future. Or maybe it might just want to gain the personal preference thing. <laughs> okay, so, the Hive Queen. As I literally just mentioned, I do have a lot of positives about this book. But I do also have a few small handfuls of issues that I have with, with the book. Hence why I'll be talking about the negatives first, and then the positives, so we can end on a positive note. Yippee! Okay, so my biggest critique with this book is actually both a critique and a compliment. This book actually feels a lot more like a Arc 1 book. Well, Arc 1 and Arc 2, but I'm mainly just saying Arc 1 because I'm stupid. But this book does very much follow the structure of Arc 1 and like half of Arc 2, where the story doesn't really kick into gear until halfway through the book. Meanwhile, for both The Lost Continent and The Hive Queen, it did seem like that the structure changed a bit to where the story kicks into gear after Part 1. But for The Poison Jungle, it does very much follow the, oh, halfway through the book, let's actually get this journey on with. While yes, saying that it's like a book from previous arc is a compliment, because I like those previous arcs, now, and I also like this one as well, of course. But it's also a critique, because not a lot happens during that first half of the book. Over which, well, yes, it is a critique that I had with the other books, but personally, those grabbed me a lot more than The Poison Jungle did. Because, like, for the first half of this book, the group walks through the jungle, arrives at the Leafwing Dome. We see the flashback to when Sundu met Willow. And then they go talk to the Queen. And that's it! <laughs> but thinking about it now, I don't really know how you could change it. I suppose you could make it shorter, but if you do, you could very easily miss out on some very important stuff towards the characters. And another critique that I have is actually with the ending. Like, I, I actually like the climax, but with the ending, I didn't realize that the... What was the cure to the Breath of Evil called? Fuck, what was it called? The Heart of Salvation. Yes, it was called the Heart of Salvation. No wonder why I forgot that. <laughs> but I didn't realize that the Heart of Salvation had been burnt and infected the entire army, basically. 
until it was mentioned by, by the characters. Hell, I didn't pick up upon that they had set it ablaze until the consequences had already happened. But once again, this could just be me being stupid and, mis and misremembering it. But while I found the climax to be good, I didn't personally realize the consequences of said climax until a while after it happened. Another small critique that I have is the prologue, like the entirety of the prologue. This prologue just felt very unnecessary to me because it doesn't tie into the main story at all and the characters featuring in it are only brought up again at the very end of the book and they're only mentioned off, they don't actually appear. Like. I could see why they were there. Like maybe they were placed there so the reader would know that ooh, there's still leaf links out there, hence explaining why Io didn't leave the continent. But I don't know, it felt kind of unnecessary. But I did like the little relationship that was hinted towards between the leaf wing and the silk wing. I have forgotten their names, so now going forward, they are now just Silkwing and Leafwing. They don't have names anymore. I think my next and last critique is like, it's pretty small, but like, it comes down to Belladonna, Sundu's mother. Personally, I would have liked to see more of her discovering that, ooh, Sundu has gone off with the Sapwings. Because to my memory, the only real acknowledgement of Belladonna seeing Sundu with Willow. It's either when Belladonna meets Queen Sequoia, or it was when they were preparing for the battle at the end. Like, there was a small acknowledgement there where it described Belladonna seeing Sundu and Willow holding talons. I personally would have liked if we could have seen Belladonna push back on that a bit more. I understand why we might not have seen a lot of Belladonna like pushing back on what Sundu did because it is justifiable to see her put that stuff to the side once she understands what's at stake with the Hive Wings coming after them. But I don't know, I personally would have preferred to have seen Belladonna like have more of a reaction to what Sundu was doing behind her back. I basically wanted a scene where Belladonna went, I know what you are. Now, onto the good things now. I liked a lot about this book, despite how low it might be in the ranking. But hey, I think that just shows how much I enjoy pretty much every book in this series. Because dragons are cool. Now, onto what I believe is probably the best thing in this book, maybe? And that's the relationship between Sundu and Willow. Like, I think they're great together, and like, they're probably the best written romance in Wings of Fire ever. Like, zero competition. Because for a lot of the other relationships in this series, as much as I may like some, none of them are really that major. While yes, some of them are essential to some characters character arcs. It's not really shown from both sides. It's not shown throughout actual interactions. This is mainly referring to both Winter and Peril, where a lot of their character arc is centered around their crush on another character. But our POV is very much one-sided for that situation, because these characters aren't actually together with the ones that they have crushes on. But I believe this is probably the first time a relationship has been emphasized in the series. We see the first ever time when Sundu meets Willow. There is a entire chapter dedicated to showing how they met. And like, it's great. It's beautiful. I love it. While they're probably not my favorite relationship in the series based on the dynamic between the two, they are also probably very easily the best written one in my opinion. And also, I need to say this just to get it out of the way, both of these characters are women, they're both female. This is, I believe, 
the first ever LGBTQ relationship in this series. And I just want to say, that's brilliant. Not only to have a relationship be very significant to this book, but to also have it be a LGBT relationship. That's great. That's very good. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more to this book due to it being centered around a character who's a lesbian. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if there's, like, a hidden metaphor for homophobia in here. But I am not a part of the LGBT community. I can't speak on that because I don't have any experience in that area. Unlike the Moon Rising video, where I compared a lot of the story towards autism, which I personally have experience in, so I can talk about that, but I can't talk about any potential hidden meaning to this book for LGBT people here because I'm not part of that community. Another thing that I really liked about this book is that I fully admit it wasn't a positive thing at first, and that's at the introduction of the quote-unquote sap wings. Because when they were mentioned, I was like, oh no, please don't tell me there is another tribe. But no, they're actually just leaf wings. The aggressive leaf wings, called passive ones, sap wings. Meanwhile, the passive ones, called the aggressive ones, poison wings. Like, wow. Very creative name there, guys. At first I was like, oh, so Sundu's tribe, they're like extremists? But then as it went on, it was kind of revealed that, oh, they're the aggressive ones, they're the passive ones. One's angry, one's happy. One will kill you, the other one will kiss you. Like, yeah, I'm just really happy that it wasn't another tribe. <laughs> Now, the last positive thing that I want to touch on until we move on to the characters. But the reveal of the Breath of Evil, which I believe also got renamed essentially as the Other Mind. I like how throughout the book, we see Sundu talk to plants. Literally. Like, she talks to plants to make them grow. Like, I'll fully admit, I was expecting it to be like Power Rangers, where it's like, Make my monster grow! But no, it's Sundu actually convincing the plants to grow. And I like how the plants do have their own voices, but it does seem like that they're really hiding something. It seems like they're scared of something. So when it comes to the end, where it's revealed that, ooh, the breath of evil is essentially controlling itself, Sundu can eventually hear it speak. Like, it's small, it's hidden, throughout most of the book. But when it gets to the end, when the Breath of Evil grows and shows itself, it's like, BAM! I'm here! I've been here this whole time! And you just didn't see it. Because <laughs> you're a dumbass! I really like how the ending essentially incorporated the whole being able to hear plants thing be involved with the actual twist. And also, the actual twist at the end, where it's revealed that, ooh, the Breath of Evil does have a mind of its own. And it's essentially being controlled in Hawthorn. Is that how you pronounce his name? Hawthorn. Hawthorn? That name doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. But where it's revealed that the Breath of Evil has essentially been manipulating Hawthorne for the last 40 years? 40, 50, 30, around there. And with it also being involved with Queen Wasp, with it essentially being there, present, in the back of her head, not convincing her to do her actions, Queen Wasp is still completely responsible for her own actions, but it's still there, in the back of her head, essentially cheering her on. But I will say, I am a little bit disappointed that we didn't get to see the explanation as to why Hawthorne's eyes don't go all blank when the other mind takes it over. We don't get to hear the actual explanation, but like, 
I wanted to hear that. I wanted to hear the pseudoscience reason why Hawthorne is essentially the host of the Breath of Evil. Like, I wanted to hear that. Okay, so, moving on to the characters. So, our first character, the main character of this book, Sundu. Sundu, also known as Snoodoo! <laughs> Bloody Snoodoo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, once again, I just want to say, Bumblebee, hilarious. <laughs> now, Sundu, while at first in Lost Continent, I wasn't that overly fond of her. But I have come around on her. I do like her. I do like how she essentially couldn't care less what anybody else has to say. Like, if she wants to do something, she's gonna do it. <laughs> And I do like her arc, where she essentially comes around and says, Ooh, maybe I shouldn't blame everybody because of the action of one person. Because during the book, it's revealed that the reason why Queen Wasp has the Breath of Evil at her command is because of a trick that Queen Sequoia and Hawthorn attempted to pull on her in the past to make Queen Wasp fall under their control through mind control because this was at the very beginning where Queen Wasp was starting the tree wars and like cutting down all the trees and like pushing back the leaf wings. Sundu's tribe is partly responsible for the state that the world is in. That essentially makes her go, oh, but I wasn't responsible for that. These bastards were. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't then blame every single hive wing for Queen Wasp's choices. So yeah, I like Sundu. It was unique to see her perspective, especially with the whole leaf speak aspect to it. And then there's Willow. I like Willow. I don't have I don't have a lot to say about Willow, but she was nice, she was kind. It was nice to see her more optimistic, more passive view contrasted against Sandu's more aggressive, go forward, attack attitude. Then there was a small character called Mandrake. Now, despite that being a bowler name, I did feel sorry for him at first because of the whole Sandu and Willow thing and with him essentially being forced into this engagement as well. But I don't know, I liked him. I'm curious to see how he could develop going forward. If he develops going forward, that is. Then there's Belladonna. She's a prick! Then there's Queen Sequoia. Now, I liked Queen Sequoia. It was nice to see a more kind of quiet and more passive queen. Essentially with her being old and being like, Oh, leave me alone. Then there's Hazel. I don't have that much to say about Hazel. Other than she's there. I like her. And it was cool to see, like, seeing this small, shy, reserved qu queen, essentially, stand up for herself and stand for her tribe. And it was very interesting to see this book include both Tsunami and Turtle. Like, really? Out of all the characters who went to... Pantala. I forgot the name for a second. It was Tsunami... And Turtle? Turtle, the small, nervous sea wing. Hm, that's what I call character development. Okay, I do think it would be nice to talk about this, considering I've talked about her in both of previous books. But Queen Wasp, she did have a overarching presence in The Lost Continent and The Hive Queen. But due to this one taking place outside of the hives, that overarching presence isn't present in this book. The only thing it can be related to is the ever-building dread of the approach of the hive wings. The only chapter where we hear her is when they capture a hive wing and they believe that they free them from Queen Wasp's control. And like, for a bit there, Queen Wasp was inside their mind, taunting everyone around her. 
and she even directly calls out Cricket and goes, Ooh, I know who you are. I have your father. Then there was Hawthorne. I just feel sorry for Hawthorne. <laughs> I, I feel so sorry for him. Like, he got sent out into the jungle all alone. <laughs> and he essentially kind of went insane. And his best friend was a wooden carving that looked like an egg. That turned out to be essentially the manifestation of the voices that he's been hearing from the other mind. Like, oh, I just thought he was being quirky. I didn't think he was being manipulated. Like, oh. Dude got turned into a really big kebab. Okay, so those were my thoughts on the poison jungle. Now, I did like this, as you heard throughout the entirety of this video. And for what it is, it's well done. But personally, I did prefer The Hive Queen out of these first three books for Arc 3 so far. I'm just very curious to see what happens next, because the next book in the main line is The Dangerous Gift, and it follows... Snowfall. Yes, Snowfall. I'm curious to see if she ties into the whole situation with the hive wings on pantala like this character is completely disconnected to the story like how will she affect this like is she going to affect this or is she just not going to be connected to that at all therefore making this book feel disconnected from the rest of this arc but the thing is despite how much i want to read that one now to find out what happens next. That isn't the next book I'm going to read. Because the next book I'm going to read will be Dragon Slayer, the Legends book. Now, I've heard a lot of conflicting things about this one. I've heard a lot of negative things. I've heard a fair few positive things. I've heard people say that it's their favorite book. I've heard people say it's their least favorite. I do think a lot of it is because we follow the point of views of scavengers quote-unquote humans well quote-unquote humans because they are humans and like understandably some people are hesitant to get into that because this is a series about dragons from the povs of dragons why would you want to read a book about humans in a world of dragons i'm i fully admit i'm not one of those people i'm very curious to see what happens next now, as for the art I did in this video, of course, I drew Sundu. Now, once again, this is my first time ever drawing one of her tribe. And that essentially led to me basically copying the canon design. And I do think the neck does look kind of empty. Like, I'll fully admit, I was on a time limit for this one. Because most of the time, I'm completely free. I'm able to put as much time as I want into the art. But here, I did have to essentially rush a bit because I was not a bit of a time limit. And this was my first time kind of experimenting with expressions. Because I'll fully admit, I am horrendous at drawing expressions. Hence why I haven't drawn one on camera before. But for Sundu... I wanted to make her look angry, like, ugh, angry, I want to destroy stuff. And you know what? I think that came across rather well. I just, I know I need to experiment more with expressions if I want to get better. And something that I didn't realize until I'd finished the drawing is that for the last three videos, for where I've made a piece of art, they've all been in the same pose. They're all looking down with their neck slightly arched back. Like, this is unintentional. I need to start drawing some new poses. <laughs> so yes, now that's pretty much it. We are now halfway through arc three. But this does mean that I'll be doing the usual half arc break, where I'm halfway through the arc, so I'm gonna take a break for a week or two. 
when I say that, I don't mean I'll be taking a break from YouTube, no. By that I mean, I'll be taking a week or two break from reading the books and making these videos, so I can experiment a bit. And also, this will be good for me, because I might finally be able to get a good night's sleep. So yes, now this is pretty much all I have to say. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you another day.